Hello and welcome to the program. I am Onye Adekunle. The rising spate of violence in several parts of the country has left many Nigerians worried and experts have said issues such as we have in Nigeria at the moment can feed mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. Now, no fewer than 1,000 Nigerians, including students, have been abducted in the country this year. While some of them have been killed by the abductors, others who have been released go about with scars of the trauma they have experienced. And joining me now to look deeper into this issue is an expert, Bola Jaye Karim, a clinical psychologist at the Police Counseling and Support Unit. Of course, she joins us uh, from Abuja via Skype. Mr. Karim, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Now, more than we've witnessed in recent times, the country is dealing with a whole lot of issues, particularly heightened tensions over insecurity, kidnapping, banditry, and so on. Now, how does this affect the psychological well-being of the country? All right, thank you very much. Uh, today, as we see it, we know that uh, a lot of crises, particularly in respect to kidnapping and insecurity has ravaged the country at the moment. And these happenings, uh, as much as they have a societal impact, these societal impacts also have psychological connotations. Um, and it spreads across the individual, their family setup, and the community at large. When anything that is happening in the nation has psychological effects. What it means is it has the capacity to affect the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. And at the moment, this has you know, transcended different spheres of our lives, our interactions with people, um, the way we guard our, our things, the more security conscious we have become as, a, as a people, and our way of life in general. Sometimes it can lead to a lot of trauma response. It can lead to a lot of safety behaviors that impact upon our general well-being as a people. Now let's also look at how the situation now from, from the point of view of uh, those that have been affected. First of all, let's talk about some of the students that have been abducted and actually regained freedom. For them, how do you see them coping after all that they've been through? Uh, I mean, they're trying to rejoin the society, trying to move on with life, trying to engage in activities with people who may not necessarily understand uh, what they've been through. Okay, thank you very much. So, for people who have been abducted, um, the truth is they've had a lot of, um, they've had a lot of exposure to traumatic incidents. Uh, they may have seen things or experienced things that have impacted on their psyche. And uh, it tells a lot on not just those that are abducted, but even those within the community or the environment of the people who were abducted. Um, the crisis situation, you know, affects a whole lot of people. Uh, they may experience what we call heightened sensitivity or hypersensitivity to stimulus. This hypersensitivity can be uh, maybe just being unusually sensitive or unusually triggered by things that would not necessarily trigger them, such as maybe the bang on the door or um, a, a noise, and they might have heightened responses to these things. They may begin to feel anxiety responses, uh, being frightened. Immediately, they hear some of this, uh, or their, their sensory perception is being enacted. Um, some people may experience what we call the experiencing, meaning that because they have experienced this trauma, it almost seems like it is happening again and in real time for them. This re experiencing can be in form of um, nightmares as well. So. You can see that it now begins to affect, you know, the person's general well-being. A person can be sleeping and all of a sudden just gets up. You know, some people can even display some certain form of um, psychotic symptoms like hall hallucinating. And there was a case that we interviewed on in, on from the um, police counseling and support unit of 
kidnapping that occurred in Abuja here sometime last week. And it was so strange, it was on Kaduna Road, it was, it was so strange to see that um, seven-year-olds and ten-year-olds were taken along with them. And when those um, children were recovered and all the, when all of them, the survivors were recovered, you know, they began to exhibit some of these symptoms that I've been talking about. And one of the fathers of the children called me and said, um, he's noticing that his boy is beginning to talk to himself and keep to himself a lot more often. And so these are some of the, of so many other things that can occur when an individual is exposed to trauma. And, and another angle I want us to look at this from is the side of parents and relatives of some of these students and other abducted persons. Of course, we know that as we speak, there are still several students that are still in the den of kidnappers across the country. And recently, there were reports that two parents of some of the students abducted in Niger State actually died of trauma. Now, just the shock of hearing that their children were kidnapped. So for parents too, how is it for them? The truth is, like I said, Trauma, in its definition, is any real or imagined either experience or witnessed event that is distressing in nature. Now, for the mere fact that it was not the parents themselves that were kidnapped or abducted, it doesn't still necessarily mean that they cannot be heavily impacted because every one of us as individuals reacts distinctively and uniquely to traumatic events. For the parents, the truth is, a lot of them might first, maybe if they, if they have secured the release of their children, become excessively security cautious. You know, part of what they might do would be to evacuate their, their wards and their businesses away from a society that they think is prone to insecurity. Another thing that, you know, is sure to happen is that most parents will usually give, give up what they are doing to ensure that their children are protected. So they, they, there, is, there is a certain sense of loss of livelihood for that period of time until things begin to normalize. So these things and more can impact upon parents as well. I mean, you've just spoken about how the trauma impacts on parents and students, but generally, I, I want to believe that this, um, this also spirals down to the entire country. Like, how do we see, how do you see this affecting the well-being of the entire country? Because these are people, or these people that are traumatized have relatives, they are friends, uh, they belong to a family, they belong to a community and all of that. So we are all sort of interconnected in a way if you get what i'm saying so how does this affect us generally as a society and of course how can we provide uh, assistance to these persons who are of course in need of our support that's a very important question first people need to realize that when something when an event is occurring and particularly if it is if it is lingering for a space of time um it begins to affect the community at large. And that's why a lot of Nigerians are panicking. You know, the media is outraged about a lot of the incidences that are happening in the country. People are beginning to wonder. People are becoming more security conscious. People are avoiding to take risks for work, for school, you know, for travels. Tourist activities are minimizing. You can't, you can't decide to want to go somewhere, not especially knowing how risky the place may be at the moment. So yes, it has capacity to impact upon our livelihood as a community, and which is why it is very important that as a society, we begin to find out ways at which we can support one another. So when I will talk, I'll, I'll talk about this in two different aspects. First, if you belong to a community that has already been exposed to a certain traumatic event, such as kidnapping and abducting of um, the members of that community, it is important that 
the community makes an attempt to form a close social group that will help the, the, the members of that community deal with that trauma, find expression, listen to the people who were directly involved with empathy, and you know, try to give what we call psychological first aid, which is basically attending to the needs of those who have been exposed to traumatic events um, in a way that is extremely humane. Also, the second light will be to communities who have not directly experienced some of these events, communities that are, in a sense, seem like they are safe now. For these communities, it is very, very important for them to also begin to take good security measures and at the same time begin to, um, you know, take preventive measures towards these things affecting their mental health. So a lot of what I would suggest would be to propagate a lot of mental health awareness in those communities and in those societies and ensure that members of the community are equipped with the right skills, the right access to professionals who can help them cope with the news that they are hearing around the society or around the country as well. Exactly. And taking it from the last statement you made, I just wanted to ask uh, that would you suggest some form of rehabilitation, like a proper rehabilitation for some of these students? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know, apart from even just the students as well, we also have to look into those who are perpetrators. Because one of the things I heard from one of the cases that I was privileged to intervene in was that these people who ad abduct people also live their own normal life, in quotes. You know, while they are doing, they are carrying out this act, they are there calling their family members, um, visiting them, um, you know, doing like their normal routine activities. So you begin to wonder, why is it that they are doing this, but yet they feel like they have the privilege to live their own normal lives? It shows that there is a problem in the orientation of the people in general. So even when they now, you know, these people are caught and they are incarcerated, it is important that they are rehabilitated in the correctional system. And then for the students, it's very important because they would have serious um, responses to the trauma that they've been exposed to. And so they have to be, um, they have to be given access to professionals who have the capacity to be able to cater to their needs at the time that they're experiencing it so that it doesn't escalate into a big mental health concern. Well, Dr. Karim, we thank you very much for speaking to us on analysis and sharing such expert and brilliant ideas with us. Thank you so much for your time. Well, we'll take a short break here, and when we return, we'll turn our attention to something different, which is developments in the oil and gas industry. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, the Niger National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, has announced plans to acquire a 20% minority equity stake in Dangote Refinery. The refinery is seen to be Africa's biggest oil refining facility and the world's largest single train plant with a 650,000 barrels a day capacity. Now, the NNPC says this is in line with the statutory role of safeguarding national energy security. And spokesperson of the state oil corporation kenny obatero said the role enables it to achieve the twin objectives of providing energy security for the country and also stimulating the nation's economic development and growth already reactions have begun to show the move and the reasons for the government's decision and joining me now to discuss more on this is zakabala an oil and gas expert who joins us via skype from another part of lagos mr bala thank you very much for your time now, first of all, I want you to help us break down this whole idea of NNPC acquiring a 20% stake in Dangote Refinery. So, in simple terms, how does it work? Well, uh, generally, uh, Dangote 
is the owner of uh, Dangote Refinery. So if NMPC is trying to acquire 20% stake in uh, Dangote, then NMPC is now called the investor, and uh, Dangote will be called, or Dangote Refinery will be called the investee. Any investor that acquires between 20% and 50% in any entity or in any investee, then that, that company, in this case, NMPC, will be said to have significant influence. Significant influence means when discussions will be taking place as far as the board of Dangote or Dangote Refinery is concerned, NMPC must be ably represented. That is it to that extent. But for somebody like me as a Nigerian and as a loyal citizen, I have always known that with a population of 200 million citizens having strategic invest, uh, strategic industrial sector, strategic commercial sector, and strategic uh, domestic sector. There is no way we are going to function effectively if we rely on less than 7,000 megawatts of electricity to supply us energy or power. And to that extent, we will always resort to other methods or other sources of power or energy that we will want to generate. And that means we will always want to go to the filling stations to either buy petrol or diesel or kerosene. So the Dangote initiative has always been a private initiative, which I appreciated and needed to be respected as a private initiative. And I've always wanted the Nigerian government to, to make sure she concentrates in revamping the national refineries. Because when you go to Korea, they rely on national refineries. When you go to China, they rely on national refineries. When you go to Saudi Arabia, they rely on national refineries. I've always been wondering why in Nigeria we cannot rely on national refinery and national assets. And recently, the federal government approved about $1.5 billion for the rehabilitation of the Portakot refinery, and now this. So the argument some people have been making is, why not use your own resources to make your own refinery work? Uh, why, why acquire equity stake in a refinery that is owned by a private investor? So is that not a valid argument? I, I, I have always wanted Dangote to be left alone because Dangote initiative has always been his private initiative, whether in fertilizer, in noodles, whether in cement, and uh, this time around in uh, oil and gas and, and downstream. I have always wanted Dangote to, to be left alone and be encouraged. Why the federal government of Nigeria decided to go this way, I cannot tell. But it was clear when NNPC was trying to explain, NNPC said it is part of their mandate or it is what is part of uh, what sets up NNPC, that to some extent any, con any company that is into refining and is producing more than 50,000 barrels per day or is refining more than 50,000 barrels per day, NNPC has the right or has been given the authorization to invest in that company. So to that extent, it simply means all companies that want to go into refining and hope to refine more than 50,000 barrels of crude oil per day within Nigeria should have it at the back of their minds that NNPC will be free and will be at liberty to want to invest in their, in their companies. So it is left to those private companies to accept or not to accept. But I want to also believe that there are some companies that will not even want Nigerian government interference. They will not want NNPC to interfere in their business. So it is left for them now to know that if they want to go into refining in Nigeria and hope to refine more than 50,000 barrels or above 50,000 barrels of crude oil per day in their refineries, then NNPC can come in at any time and invest. Do you think this move will be a sort of a setback 
to initial plans the government made to rehabilitate the Port Harcourt refinery and indeed the other three refineries in the country? But to some extent, I mean, it will be a distraction because when you look at it, uh, Nigeria is suffering from uh, ballooning debts. You know, the country is almost prostrate. You know, uh, the citizens are spending their hard and uh, disposable income uh, in a country that is suffering from serious inflation. And uh, we have less than 7,000 megawatts of electricity to supply energy to more than 200 uh, million citizens. So most of us resort to buying petrol, kerosene, or diesel. So when our government or oh, through NNPC said they were going to start the revamping of our refineries, we felt happy because we felt NNPC will now stop that, that, that impulse-focused deregulation and look inward so that we can get our crude oil locally, refine it locally, and be doing better. But now that we have heard that NNPC wants to go and invest not even in one com uh, refinery, uh, that is privately owned, but six different refineries, then the question is, where will the money come from? I will see it more as a distraction. I think NNPC will be appreciated more if she, re if she refurbishes her own four refineries and make sure we enjoy self-sufficiency rather than getting distracted to go and become an, an investor in some of those companies. Where will the money to invest come from? And w when she does that, to what extent will she pay attention to, to the local refineries that she has that are four in number? Or is there uh, an unheeding plan to later sell off those refineries to some other people? Then NNPC will in turn invest in her own refineries that she will sell to others. Uh, time will tell. And that was why some of us said it is a developing story. We will continue to watch it. But the good thing is we are loyal citizens we will be ready to support our government, but if we notice policies or actions or, 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 or things that are not going right with our government, we are bound to make our suggestions, if possible, even criticize our government, but we will criticize our government constructively. And to even think that this is coming on the heels of the report that out of the 7,000 reserves that have been discovered in the country, only 1,700 is currently producing crude oil. But is that something that we should actually be worried about? Yes, we should be worried because uh, I'm happy you asked that, that important question. To, to a great extent, uh, drilling campaigns have not been going on in Nigeria. Uh, there was a time in Nigeria, we had more than 40 drilling rigs, 40 rigs drilling daily. But as I speak to you, quote me anywhere, quote me today and say, I said, I, Zakabala said, in Nigeria today, there are no up to five rigs that are actively drilling. There was a time when in this country, only one company, one operating company will have up to seven, eight, or nine rigs drilling at a time. But today, in the whole of Nigeria, the drilling rigs that are active are not up to seven. And like I said, there was a time when we had more than 30 to 40 rigs active. So to that extent, that will tell you that uh, investors have either moved to, to better investment havens or Nigeria is suffering from business climate hostility. And those hostilities are not encouraging investment. And it's the same thing with exploration campaign. So if you are not doing so much exploration, how can you build reserves? So to that extent, I mean, that is also a pointer that something is wrong with the upstream and downstream sector of the Nigerian oil and gas because the midstream does not even exist or has not been existing. So speaking of solutions now, how do we get things to where it's supposed to be? What can be done? What can we do to make our oil and gas industry function optimally? The answers are very, very simple. Most of the time when I hear that the Nigerian oil and gas industry is not doing well, I feel sick as a practitioner. I feel very sorry for this country called Nigeria. I say so because I am a practitioner in the oil and gas industry. All we need to do is to make sure we do the right thing. The only thing that is affecting the Nigerian oil and gas industry is called corruption. But corruption is an attitude. 
just like prostitution or alcoholism or drug addiction. If you want to stop a bad attitude or walk away from a bad attitude, you can walk away from it. All we need to do is to walk away from corruption and we make sure the right uh, people are, are always appointed or recruited into the right jobs. Put the right pets in the right hole. That is all. If you look at it, the oil and gas industry is supposed to be a very organized industry. You know? So to some extent, what we need to do is to make sure we, we are focused. Look at the petroleum industry bill. We used to have a very fine document that was 223 pages. But we, before we knew what was happening, it was the PID was broken into four. Even after balkanizing it into four, they made attempts to pass the petroleum industry governance bill and left the other three. But even that petroleum industry governance bill that we call PIGB has not been assented to. And let me tell you, the real things even that are supposed to be done before the PIB is passed has not been done or have not been done. We have not discussed what host community, how or how host community will be taken care of. In fact, if you ask some people to define petroleum host communities for you today, they cannot even define it. So they have not been able to sort out issues with host communities. They have not also been able to sort out issues of fiscal regimes. If they don't sort out all those and they decide to pass a watered or a watery PIB, I am telling you, Nigeria will regret it, investors will go away, and we will continue to experience uh, uh, what, what I can best describe as turnover of investors. Local investors will run away from Nigeria. Foreign investors will run away from Nigeria. We just have to do the right thing. And all I also want to ask Nigerian government, especially through, oh, in this case, NNPC, because when you talk about the oil and gas industry, I mean, the face of Nigeria is the NNPC. We are a member of OPEC. Why can't we talk to OPEC members to guide us? They are all doing well. We've not been able to also manage our gas resource to be able to gas, drive gas turbines and generate electricity. It's really sickening. Refining is elementary chemistry. Anybody that tells you that refining is very complex, that person is not being honest to you. Refining is basic chemistry. We are supposed to have functional refineries. And even the modular refineries that we've been talking about, you, you will be shocked to know that modular refineries do not produce uh, 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 petrol because they are not equipped with catalytic cracking units. So many Nigerians even think when you have modular refineries, then there will be enough petrol all over the places. And that is, that, that is not correct. We should try to be as honest as possible to our citizens because Nigeria is supposed to be the continental hub for Africa. Whether you talk about oil and gas, you talk about health, you talk about education, or even politics or political science. The oil and gas expert, Zaka Balawo, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us on analysis. Thank you for your time. But that's where we'll call it a wrap on this episode of the program. I am Oni Adekile. Thank you for watching.